So let's talk about three major spinal cord reflexes, okay? They include the stretch reflex, which is kind of our simplest one, the Golgi tendon reflex, and the withdrawal reflex, which is kind of our most complex. So the stretch reflex. So we had our receptor. We had our receptor, right? Our sensory receptor. Our control center and our effector, right? In our reflex arc that we just talked about. In this case, the sensory receptor, this little dude right here, is something called a muscle spindle. The muscle spindle is actually embedded in our muscles. See the green? Now this is actually embedded in the skeletal muscle of our quadricep. Okay, this is our sensory neuron right here. The reflex arc goes sensory to motor neuron causing an action potential. Notice that I said nothing about an interneuron. Remember I told you we have monosynaptic reflexes? This is one of those. There is no interneuron in this specific reflex. So it's monosynaptic. Muscle contracts basically in response to being pulled. So this is when your doctor hits your knee with a mallet, okay? The hammer comes and actually hits this patellar ligament. See the space behind it? It basically goes into that space. And when it does that, it pulls the patella, which pulls the patellar tendon, which causes the quad to be pulled on. As a result of that pull, the sensory neuron sends a signal up and it connects to this alpha motor neuron. See this motor neuron? That actually causes this muscle to contract and you kick. When you kick, when somebody hits your knee, this is why. This is, um, like I said, it's a reflex. It's not something we control. Now I do want you to notice that yes, we have this monosynaptic reflex that comes back down, but there is something going up here. You can actually see that. We know that we kick. There is a signal that is sent to our brain to uh, you know, alert us that we just kicked our leg. But in reality, that signal is later than the signal that goes to your leg to make you kick which is why I said I could bet you $5,000 as long as you don't have nerve damage, I can make you kick your leg because your, I guess the, the action of kicking is decided before it gets to your brain that you kicked in the first place. So the Golgi tendon reflex, this is actually happening down here in this muscle. That kick reflex that's happening because this quad muscle is contracting yanks on this muscle down here, okay? So we call it the Golgi tendon reflex because the sensory receptor, the sensory receptor that's here, control center, effector, this is actually embedded inside of a tendon. So we call that the Golgi tendon organ. It's embedded in the tendon attached to the muscle below your leg. It's down here, okay? So in the reflex arc, your sensory neuron actually synapses with an inhibitory interneuron. Remember, an inhibitory neuron releases neurotransmitter that shuts everything down. So the motor neuron actually gets turned off meaning that the muscle it's attached to just completely relaxes, like it goes flaccid, I'm not gonna work anymore. So when this gets pulled, when I kick my leg out, when this gets pulled, I kick my leg out and this gets pulled on, okay? It sends a signal up and there is an interneuron, but It's inhibitory. 
meaning I need to shut this motor neuron off. So I send signal out that basically hyperpolarizes this alpha motor neuron, meaning that this muscle just goes flaccid. There is no reason for that muscle to move anymore. Now, why? Okay, imagine if both muscles tried to contract at the same time, one trying to bend my leg and one trying to straighten my leg. The chances of damage happening are very, very high. I would tear something somewhere. So instead of doing that or risking that, I get this one to contract, but then this one automatically just lets go so that my leg will kick and there won't be a fight for what position my leg should be in. Now, the withdrawal flexor reflex. Basically, imagine walking and you step on a nail and the nail goes into your foot. What's the first thing you're gonna wanna do? Well, you're probably gonna wanna pull your foot away. The thing is, if you're walking, right, you're walking, And there's a nail here. If you were to pull this foot up automatically, this leg is bent because you're walking. You would just fall to your knee. So that isn't a good idea. So I need to pick this foot up. Absolutely. I just stepped on a nail. But I need this leg to kind of straighten up and catch me while I pick this foot up. This leg needs to catch me. So I've got kind of several things happening at once. The pain is getting to my brain, telling this leg to contract, but at the same time, it's going across my body to the opposite leg, telling it, hey, I need you to catch me. So we've got several things happening. We've got reciprocal innervation. While the agonist is contracting, automatic relaxation of the antagonist is happening. If I need to bend my leg away from the, the painful stimulus, if I need to bend my leg away from the tack, the muscle that normally straightens my leg, I need that to shut off. Because again, I don't want two fighting muscles. Crossed extensor, to extend means to straighten out, right? Crossed, I need to go to the other side of my body. I need to go across to get my other leg to extend to catch me because I just stepped on a nail, okay? So let's talk about getting my foot away from the painful stimulus first. So what's my sensory receptor? Well, the pain receptor is my sensory receptor because I just stepped on a nail. It carries an action potential through the dorsal root, which all sensory information goes in through the back, when they synapse with excitatory interneurons. Excitatory means I'm gonna get an action potential. They synapse with an alpha motor neuron it stimulates the muscles to remove the limb from the painful stimulus. I need to get away from that pain. I do have collateral branches that's, um, of the sensory neurons that synapse with ascending fibers to my brain. I am aware that I am in pain. I am consciously aware that really, really hurts. So let's look at this. Here's the nail. Here's my sensory receptor. Here's my sensory neuron that carries the information up to my brain, right? Or my spinal cord in this case. Here's my excitatory interneuron. Excitatory meaning I'm gonna get an action potential. It causes this motor neuron to fire. This motor neuron is attached to this muscle. Remember, this is the muscle that bends my leg. This is the muscle that straightens my leg. My quad straightens my leg, but my biceps femoris, I think, actually bends it. So when I cause this to contract, I actually pull my foot away from the painful stimulus. So this is the withdrawal. I need to, ow, I need to get my foot away from it. Now remember something. I can't have this muscle trying to straighten my leg at the same time I'm trying to get this muscle to bend my leg away from the nail, right? So this muscle, I need to shut it off. 
Imagine two parts of your body trying to fight each other, one trying to keep your legs straight, the other one trying to bend it, and the entire time your foot is sitting on a nail. No, let's not do that. So let's talk about the reciprocal innervation. Basically, this is helping me to get my foot away from the nail. It reinforces the ability of me to withdraw my foot from that nail. So as the pain receptors carry information, carry action potentials to the spinal cord, they split. Half go to the agonist, the one that's helping me to bend my leg away. Half go to these collateral branches, these other branches, and they synapse with an inhibitory interneuron. What do I want to happen to the muscle that straightens my leg? I want to turn it off. So we call this reciprocal innervation. I've got these inhibitory interneurons that synapse with the alpha motor neurons of the antagonist muscle. This one bends my leg, which is the action that I want. The, mm -hmm, the antagonist straightens my leg, right? Which is what I don't want. So it's an antagonist. If it's an inhibitory interneuron, it's going to basically cause it to relax, okay? So it relaxes. Thus, it doesn't oppose the action of the agonist. What's the last thing I need at this point? Fighting muscles. So if you look, here's my sensory neuron carrying information up, right? Still carrying the information up, but it splits. I've got one going to my brain, one going to my antagonist, and one going to my agonist. What do I want to happen? I want my leg to get away from the painful stimulus. So I send an alpha motor neuron to excite my biceps femoris to bend my leg away from this nail. At the same time, I've got another branch coming up to an inhibitory neuron to shut this alpha motor neuron down to this muscle. Why? Because this is the muscle that would straighten my leg. If my leg straightens, I'm gonna jam that nail further into my foot. So I relax this muscle at the same time I'm contracting this muscle to basically ensure that I'm getting my foot off of that nail. Now remember, this is the one leg my other leg still has to catch me. Whoops. So the crossed extensor, I need to go across my body and get my opposite leg to extend to catch me, right? So during flexion of one limb, when I'm bending that leg away from the nail caused by the withdrawal reflex, the opposite limb, my other leg, has to be stimulated to extend. So half goes to the agonist muscle to bend the leg away from the painful stimulus. Then I've got those collateral branches of those pain receptors going across my spinal cord, across that white commissure, okay, to activate an alpha motor neuron in the opposite leg. It causes the muscles to contract and support the body well, the body weight, during the withdrawal. So again, here's the one that I'm trying to get away from the nail, right? Because there's the nail. Here's my sensory neuron coming up. Goes to the muscle to get my leg to pick up. Goes to the other muscle to get that muscle to relax. Goes to the brain to tell me I've stepped on something. Here's that interneuron that goes across to the opposite side of my body. See how it's going across the white commissure? So now, am I aware that I need to stand on my leg? Yes. So this is a somatic motor neuron getting stimulated to go to my opposite leg and get my quad to straighten my leg out so that it'll catch me so that I can pick this other leg over here up and get it away from the nail. So this leg stretches and catches me. This is the 
flexor withdrawal cross extensor reflex. And believe it or not, this one is really simple compared to some of the reflexes that happen in the body. So reflexes do not operate as isolated entities within the nervous system because of divergent and convergent pathways. Remember, divergent means that it goes in several different directions. Convergent means that I've got several things coming together in one point. So that pain withdrawal reflex, reciprocal reflex, cross extensor, and the signal to the brain, these are four different things that are happening all at the same time. I'm getting one muscle to contract to get my leg away from the nail, making sure the opposite muscle relaxes so that they don't fight each other, going to my brain and telling my brain, hey, you just did something that was really painful. And I've got a fourth signal going across my body to my other leg to get it to catch me. Just start walking and then pick up a leg really, really quick. And you'll see your other leg extends to catch you because if it doesn't, you're gonna fall down. So the neurotransmitters, those chemicals, they can be inhibitory or stimulatory, basically meaning they can stop a, an action potential or they can cause an action potential. When we talk about the muscle that we want contracting, heck yes, it's excitatory. I want that muscle to contract. If we're talking about getting the opposite muscle to relax though, it's inhibitory. I don't want that muscle to do anything. So we've been talking about the spinal cord and how the spinal cord works. Now we're gonna talk about the peripheral nerves. Okay, so the things coming off of your spinal cord. Your nerves, the peripheral nerves that are in your body, consist of axons, Schwann cells, and connective tissue. It's not just one neuron. If you look, see this? This is one neuron. Do you see how many of these there actually are? That's a lot. This whole thing with the little fat pad and the arteries and veins and this connective tissue on the outside with the epineurium on the outside and the bundles with the perineurium and the endoneurium surrounding each individual cell, this is a nerve. So when I say a nerve isn't one individual cell, this is why I say that. So endoneurium is a connective tissue coating that basically covers every single cell. Perineurium bundles these together. So each dark blue that you see here, 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 that's a perineurium. And each individual unit like this is called a fascicle, okay? If I take several fascicles or fasciculi and I put them together and cover them again, this is called the epineurium. This is a nerve. You'll notice that it isn't just my neurons. I've got blood vessels, I've got connective tissue, I've got fat pads in here too. So when we talk about nerves, we're not just talking about individual cells anymore. So our spinal nerves in the peripheral nervous system, we're not talking central anymore. You have 31 pairs. Again, because you have right and you have left. You've got right and you've got left. So you've got C1, left and right. You've got C, hang on, C2, left and right. You've got C3, left and right. C4, left and right. We call them pairs because we've got two sides of our body. 25 of your spinal nerves exit through the intervertebral foramina. If you look on your PowerPoints for um, lab, you'll see that these are actually coming from between the vertebral bones. There's a little kind of arch between the two bones and you've got this thing coming out of that space. This is the spinal nerve. Okay, in the picture, the spinal nerve is the yellow thing. One pair, the first pair, C1, actually doesn't come out from in between the vertebra. 
it actually is below the skull and on top of the first vertebra. So it doesn't come through that intervertebral foramina. Foramina meaning whole. Foramen, foram, for, foramina, it just means whole. Um, S1 through S5 actually exit through the sacral foramina. Instead of coming out to the sides like this, if you go down here to the sacrum, they actually kind of come out at odd angles through these holes. And you can actually also see them coming out through the opposite side. <clears throat> the coccygeal nerves. Okay, well, I skipped a whole section. Let me go back. You have eight cervical nerves, C1 through 8. You have 12 thoracic. They're right around the rib cage. You have five lumbar. You've got five sacral. In lab, though, in the pictures in lab, you only have four because that fifth is actually kind of buried in bone, so you can't really see it. And then you've got one coccygeal, which we call C naught. See, this little zero here is not, so that you don't get confused with C1 through C8. They labeled it C naught, so that you know it's the one that's down here in the coccyx, okay? If you can remember breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, you can remember how many are there. Breakfast, if we're, you know, a normal person who work, works normal hours, it would be eight o'clock in the morning. So there are eight cervical vertebra. Again, if we were a normal, normal person who had norm, normal business hours, lunch would probably be at 12 o'clock. There are 12 thoracic nerves. Lumbar is at five o'clock. Again, normal person with a normal schedule, you would eat at five o'clock. You would eat dinner at five o'clock. So that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For the lab specifically, the pictures of the uh, sacral vertebra, there are only four. So I think of somebody coming home after school and having a snack at four o'clock before dinner at five. Reality, if she shows you a picture that looks like this, it would be five. And then the coccygeal, you can't mistake that one because it's literally sitting right on the coccyx right here. Okay, you can actually see it right there. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. The letter is indicative of where the nerve emerges. You need to understand that we're not talking about from the spinal cord itself. We're talking about from the bones because all of these that are down here, all of these, remember the spinal cord ends at L2. So these are traveling some distance before emerging from the bone. So we're talking about where is it coming out at the bone when we talk about, um, the labeling as far as the letter. The number is indicative of the location. The smallest number is the highest, the most superior. The largest number is the most inferior. Dermatome. Remember that your spinal nerves all carry sensory information. Remember that it's got that entrance from the back from the um, posterior root. So nerves arising from each region of the spinal cord and the vertebral column supply really specific regions on your body. Each spinal nerve has a specific cutaneous sensory distribution. In other words, each spinal nerve, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, each one is in charge of a specific section of your body. This picture is a dermatomal map. It tells you every single spinal nerve and what it is responsible for carrying information for. And if you look, you can see that at his shoulders, it's C4. So if I touch you on your shoulders, anywhere here where it says C4, the nerve carrying that information up to your brain is C4. That's why we say that. If, however, I were to touch, let's say, your outer forearm here, well, in that case, it would be T1. If I touched your elbow right there, if I were to touch that, T1 is the one that's responsible for taking that information up to your brain. This whole picture from bottom of my feet to the top of my head, this is the dermatomal map. It's the whole thing. However, Let's say S2, just this little area right here. That's a dermatome. It's the specific dermatome for 
um, sacral nerve two. Okay. Now, in movies, you will see, you know, somebody is in a car accident and they say they can't feel their legs and a doctor will come up and say, can you feel this? And it, he'll touch in a specific region. Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? And if they get to a point where the patient says, I don't feel that anymore, the reason they're doing that is because of the dermatomal map. Let's say I get to about here and the patient says, I don't feel that anymore. The first thing the doctor is going to say is, okay, I need you to do an MRI. I need you to go from about T6 up here because I stopped at T8, right? From T6 to T11 because whatever happened happened in this section of your spinal cord because now you can't feel that. When they do that, there are several reasons. One, an MRI going from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet or from the top of your head to the bottom of your spinal cord, let's say to your butt, is going to take hours. Basically engaging that, that MRI for hours, that's not really conducive to getting patients in and out. Two, that kind of MRI going from the top of your head to the bottom of your rear end is going to be so expensive. Let me tell you, I've had MRIs in one place, like my shoulder. I mean, it wasn't even like I had to go huge, just my shoulder. And that was like 900 and something dollars. So yeah, and that was with insurance. So this, you know, doing a whole body scan, not really cost effective either. Something else, if you have a patient who is damaged like that, time is really important. Having them sit in an MRI for hours and hours and hours only means that their body's reaction to the damage is going to cause even more damage. So being able to use these to kind of narrow down where something happens is really important. Something else, just to kind of give you another example. So in the year 2001, I had back surgery because I had injured my back very, very badly. And they ended up having to go in and do some repair. So when it happened, um, I ended up losing feeling in part of my foot. I lost feeling on the outside of my foot and basically my baby toe. I can't feel my baby toe on my left foot anymore. Um, I also can't really feel the heel around there and I can't feel this side of my leg. So if you look there, you'll notice that it says L5 and S1. Guess where the damage was? Between my last lumbar and my first sacral vertebra. That was where the damage was. So that damage and that deadness, that non-feeling that I have there makes sense. And I have seriously injured my foot before and I didn't even know that I'd done it because I don't feel that part of my foot anymore. One time I was walking by my parents' brick fireplace and I scraped the side of my foot and I was bleeding all over the place. I had no clue because I don't feel that side of my foot where my baby toe is anymore. So these are actually sensory pathways. They're in charge of bringing sensory information in. So that's a dermatome.